Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 71. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. Hey there, everybody. I am Jay Scott. I am your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. And this week, I guess I'm also your host because Carol Scott is taking the week off. And yes, I know what you're thinking. It can't nearly, it can't be nearly as good a show without Carol. And I agree, but I did my best and we do have an amazing guest. So hopefully between him and myself, we've, uh, we've, we've made up for what we're losing with Carol Scott. So this week on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, we have a best-selling author, Josh Kaufman, and he is author of one of the classic business books called The Personal MBA, Master the Art of Business. And today, September 1st, 2020, he is releasing the 10th anniversary edition of that book. So The Personal MBA, Master the Art of Business, the 10th anniversary edition is available today. And Josh is with us to share his wisdom on business, on being an entrepreneur, starting in business, and what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. In this episode, we touch on a lot of different topics. We're kind of all over the place, and that's good because I wanted to get as much information out of Josh as I could in the short time that we had him. But we start with the discussion of... Uh, the the big misnomer that business has to be difficult, that it it's rocket science, it's not. And as Josh puts it, business is simple, but it's not necessarily simplistic. And so we talk a bit about that concept of business not being as hard as a lot of people make it seem and what we can do to kind of make inroads as entrepreneurs uh, in this world where everybody seems to think that business is really, really difficult then we get all the way towards the end where we talk about this concept of Akazia. Um, and you've probably never heard this term before. I had never heard this term before, but it's this idea of this struggle that we all have to bring ourselves to do the things that we know we should be doing, but for some reason we just can't bring ourselves to do or we do the opposite even though we know it's not good for us. Um, and Josh talks to us about what this, this term means, how it manifests in our life, and most importantly, how we can overcome and power through this idea of not doing those things that we know we should be doing in our business and our personal lives. And uh, just the wisdom that comes out of Josh's mouth throughout this entire episode is amazing. Make sure you listen to the end where Josh gives us his best tips for getting started in business now and also gives us his warnings on things that we should be avoiding as new business owners so that we don't make those mistakes that a lot of new business owners make. It's just a great episode. Um, and make sure you pick up your copy of the Personal MBA, Master the Art of Business today. For more information about Josh, the book, and everything we talk about in this episode, check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow71. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow71. Okay, now without any further ado, let's welcome Josh Kaufman to the show. How are you doing today, Josh? Jay, I'm great. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. I am thrilled to have you here. So we've been doing the show for about a year now. And it's funny, your book has been sitting on my bookshelf for about eight years now. Um, and <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, and we were just talking that I guess I have probably the second edition. The first edition was released in 2010. And you have the, I guess this is the third edition. So first, congratulations on the Thank release you. of your 10th anniversary edition of uh, the personal MBA. And, uh, and thanks for being here. Thanks. It's, it's an honor. And, um, and thank you for picking up one of the early editions of the book. That, that means a lot to me. Absolutely. So I love the way you've laid out uh, this book. It, it's very thorough. It's very linear. Everything's laid out in bite-sized chunks. I absolutely love it. And I love the fact that 
I, I think of this book kind of as a litmus test for those who are going into business and maybe thinking about going to business school. I can't tell you the number of people that have said to me, I'm getting ready to go to business school and I'll recommend this book and I'll basically say, read this book. And if you get halfway through it and you think this isn't for me, well, business school is probably not for you. Um, but if you get halfway through this book and you say, this this is what I want to be doing, then it's a, it's a great litmus test for deciding, okay, maybe business school is the right way to go. Um, I always talk about the fact that business school is kind of two things. It's the academics and it's the networking. And the academic side of things we can learn ourselves. We can learn from Google. We can learn from your book. We can learn from other sources. It's the networking side of things that business school is kind of good for. So I, I like to tell people, and I'm sorry, I'm being long-winded about this, but I always tell people. Oh, you can just talk this whole time. <laughs> like just, this is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I guess long story short, is anybody out there that kind of is looking to, it, it, it kind of wants to know, what does a business school curriculum look, look like? What does a, a, a two or three year syllabus for business school look like? Start with this book because this is going to give you pretty much everything you're going to learn in business school. And as we're going to talk about on this show, it actually talks about things that we don't discuss in business school that much. So I, I love that as well. So now that I've talked for a half hour, I'm going to give you an opportunity <laughs> to kind of break the boredom. Um, so talk to us about what is your backstory? How did you get to the point of writing this book? What was your goal with the book? And 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 basically, how did this book come about? Yeah, so so first is it's always wonderful to hear, you know, when when you're a person who has created something with certain intentions or with with wanting to have the person on the other end have a certain experience in mind, it's always really gratifying to hear someone who you don't know and have never met, like have the experience that you want them to have. So for I'm I'm thrilled that um, that you have found the book useful and you found the book useful enough to to share it with other people. That that really truly means a lot. Excellent. Um, the the personal MBA uh, as a project um, has been around for a long time. I've been working on this 15 years now. And the the genesis of the project was was um, I was in university and I was uh, in an internship program working for a big company, a uh, big consumer goods, uh, consumer, consumer goods uh, company called Procter & Gamble. So uh, I, I was doing uh, technology first and then product development and marketing and sales uh, for big consumer brands, Tide, Crest. Uh, my specialty was, was in home care goods. So uh, the brands that I worked on were uh, Mr. Clean, Swiffer, Dawn, Cascade, and Febreze. And uh, Funny story related to that is uh, I knew I, I had gotten the job. I didn't know where I was going to be placed yet. And about two weeks before I was uh, set to, to start work, um, that's when I shaved my head. And then lo and behold, the first brand I was assigned to uh, was Mr. Clean, which that it doesn't really hit unless we're doing video and we're doing video. So, so this is this is great. Um, people thought I was really excited about that. For, for any of our listeners that aren't watching this, uh, safe to say that Josh is a reasonable facsimile of Mr. Clean with the, with the, with the shaved head. I, I could use some help on the muscles part, but the shaved head <laughs> I've got down pretty well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I ha was going into this inter internship, uh, again, um, uh, undergrad, uh, undergrad in, in business technology. And I was going to be working with people who had just graduated from the top 15 MBA programs in the world. I mean, that's the, the, the general feeder process into the job that I, was, that I was holding. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that I understood what I was doing, um, that when people were, were using concepts or language, I wanted to make sure I understood what they were saying. I wanted to be able to be an equal at the table where decisions were being made. And so uh, I thought about for, a few days, like, should I, should I take some time off? Should I go through an MBA program? Should I have this experience that all of my peers have had? Um, and after doing some research, it, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for me for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, the first was that I already had the job that people go to business school to get, like quitting that job and then coming back. That, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, the other is that from a cost standpoint, and both in terms of monetary cost and in opportunity cost, the, the two years that a full-time program typically takes, 
that's a big ask. That's that's expensive. And so I wanted to figure out for me if 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 the goal is to learn these things, to learn these essential useful ideas that you can apply to any business. That's something that you can do on your own. You know, learning is something that happens in your head. It's not necessarily something that happens at a university or in a classroom or in a formal environment. And so the personal MBA as a project started as me reading a, a whole bunch of books and resources and trying to do research on my own to figure out in the grand deep sense, what are businesses? How do they work? How do you analyze an existing business? How do you make it better? And how do you improve a business in a way that A, gets the result you're looking for and B, doesn't provoke all sorts of un unanticipated consequences or second or third order effects down the line. And so uh, I started reading and, and researching. Um, a, a summer of reading and research turned into a year, turned into two years, turned into five years uh, because I, I, I found this, this subject fascinating and, and rewarding. Um, business is one of those topics that is everywhere in our society and culture. It touches all of us in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it is one of the most complex, multidisciplinary areas of human experience, you know, bringing in knowledge and, and, and skills from all sorts of different aspects of society, but then using that in a way that does something really unique. Uh, because when you have when you have a business that works, you've created something that benefits other people, and you figure out how to do that in a way that provides value and benefit to them as the purchaser. But then by purchasing it, they are supporting you and helping you do this more um, or or in a in a way that is rewarding in the long term and is a way that is sustainable long term. And that's really unique and fascinating. And and so. Um, the first edition of the personal MBA book was really the culmination of about uh, five solid years of research and uh, a year and a half of writing. And then um, the, the two subsequent editions uh, were, were opportunities to go back to uh, revisit the, the manuscript in its entirety and say, okay, are there, are there things that should have been in the first edition or the, the last edition that, that I missed or should be in there? Or is there a way to explain some of these ideas in a more clear or comprehensive or concise way? And so, yeah, the, the 10th anniversary edition uh, is, is a full revision. I, I did the full 500 page book, went through every, every bit of it and improved it to be the best that I can make it at this point in time. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on the release. Uh, actually, it's out today. Um, so. I'm going to start with a very, I'm going to start with the most difficult question I could probably, I could, I could probably ask of you or anybody on this show, but for all of our, our wannabe entrepreneurs out there, for everybody, all of our listeners that want to start a business, get into business, um, what do we do? Do we pick up your book and read it from page one to page 367, I think it is, and and then go out and start a business. Um, do we do we start a business and then I mean what what's the process of getting from from zero to having a successful business and where does the learning the the academics the stuff that you lay out in your book how does that fit into the process? Sure. Okay. So the 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 shortest version of this. Yes. Please pick up the book. Um, skip the introduction because the introduction is a lot about business school. You may or may not care about that at this point. Go to chapter one and it's uh, the very first concept in chapter one is how to understand business in a clear systematic way. So the section you're looking for, just go straight to the table of contents. Um, it's called the five parts of every business. And one of the things I, I know you, you mentioned earlier that you had a business school background. Um, I did a, a undergrad business honors program. So you know, basically undergrad plus a little bit of the, the uh, business school, school stuff. I don't know about you, but one thing that struck me as really odd is there was never an attempt to define what a business is or what a business does. Just like businesses are things that make money. And, uh, and if you're doing that, then you're running a good business. Good job. 
And, um, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why I, I like the way the book is laid out because in business school, it's basically you get in there, you pick your classes and they start teaching you something and you don't get a larger context. You don't get to see what does this look like in a linear fashion? It's just, here's a topic, here's a topic, here's a topic. There's no transition between the topics. There's no context of how these topics fit together. And yeah, so you talk about in the book and, and I'll quote from the book, um, a, a business is, and you mentioned the five things, it creates and delivers something of value that other people want or need uh, at a price they're willing to pay in a way that satisfies customers' needs and expectations so that the business brings in enough profit to make it worthwhile for the owners to continue operation. Yes, I, I was reading that. I did not memorize that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I love that because it really is it is the definition of why we are doing all of this. And you get into business school and you walk into that first class and they start talking about okay, this is what a cash flow statement looks like or this is how we do marketing or this is whatever and they don't start from this is why we're here. This is why we're doing this. This is what a business is. So yeah, I, 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 I just to, to cut you off, I apologize for that. But yeah, no, I, I love the fact that you kind of start at the beginning. Yeah. So there, and, and the background in terms of this is before I launched into this research project, I was looking for a book like this. Like I was looking for help me understand business at the 50, 100,000 foot level first. So we, we're covering all the basis, and then we, we can go deeper into additional topics as we need to. And so there are two kind of organizing frameworks for the book. Uh, the first is the five parts of every business. So when we look at what a business is and what it does, it's exactly that. It has five parts, value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, and finance. And if you understand what those five things are, why they're important, and how they fit together, it doesn't matter if you're looking at one of the largest corporations in the world or the smallest of the small garage venture that's just getting started. They all work according to that framework, those principles. So if you start there, if you understand that stuff in a deep level, you understand how businesses work. But because business is complex and multidisciplinary, you can't stop there because businesses are created by people for the benefit of other people. And so if you don't know how people work, you're gonna have a really hard time, both in terms of working with yourself, doing all the, th the business things that need to be done in order to make the business successful, but also working with clients and contractors and customers and operating in society in a way that helps the business be successful long-term. And then the third part, which I, I think most business schools, at least the curricula that I've seen, skip almost entirely is complex systems. So businesses are complex systems that operate within other complex systems like societies and markets and governments and, and you know, the largest scale, uh, scale systems we can think of. And so understanding that these things are systems and there are principles and techniques and concepts that can help us understand what systems are and how they work. That can help us when it comes time, time to, okay, I'm stepping into a job. I have certain responsibilities. Um, I report to certain people or I've, I have certain customers or constituencies. What are the things that I can do right now to understand the environment that I'm operating in and the constraints that I'm operating under? And then apply effort or attention to points of leverage, places where uh, you can make an enormous impact very quickly by operating, not, not just doing the right thing, but doing it in the right way at the right time. Um, that sort of knowledge is very, very beneficial. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's how the book is structured. Part, uh, is, part one is business, part two is people, part three is systems. And when we talk about business, uh, the first five chapters of the book are value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, and finance. I love that. And I, I want to delve into some of those in more detail. But I also want to point out that um, I, and, uh, when I talk about business school, I love business school, but there are parts of business school that I really hated. And one of the things that I look back on and I think about with business school is it felt very 
elitist. Um, Mm. Not necessarily in a bad way, but basically the attitude that we're special for being here. We're special if if we can learn this stuff in a university setting. It means we're going to somehow have more chance of being successful entrepreneurs and start big businesses and, and that in some way, shape or form, we're better than people that don't go to business school. And yet, the longer I actually do business, start business, run businesses, the more I'm starting to realize that it really, and and I'm going to use your words from chapter one, it's not rocket science. Um, mm-hmm. in, in fact, to, to, to quote the book, um, you say, anyone who tries to make business sound more complicated than, the, than, uh, than it is, is either trying to oppress you or trying to sell you something you don't need. And so I think it's really important. And I want to give you an opportunity to, to address this. It's really important for our listeners to recognize and, and to constantly remember that it's not rocket science and you don't need an MBA to, to be a successful business owner. You don't need business experience. You don't need to run a large business. People from all walks of life wake up every day with an idea and figure it out and become successful. Yeah. The, the way I like to think about business in general is that it's simple, but not simplistic. And so the things that we do on a daily basis, yeah, that they're not rocket science. You're making something people want. You're you're getting their attention and hopefully provoking their interest in this thing. You're selling it to them. You're delivering it to them so they're happy um, and in a way that makes them hopefully want to do business with you again. And then you are trying to figure out, okay, where's money flowing out? Where's money flowing in? Is more money flowing in than flowing out? And is it enough to make all of this worth it? Like, that's it. Like, really? And so... But the actual implementation of that in a functioning business can be quite detailed and quite complex. And so the approach that I I prefer to use to understand business in general um, is, um, and if you're familiar with the investor, Charlie Munger um, and and Munger's mental models, um, this is an idea that there are a handful of concepts in each of these areas that provide most of the value or pull most of the weight in, in terms of conceptual understanding of what's important and what to focus on. And so really the, the, the place to start in understanding business in general is take one of these topics like value creation or like marketing or like sales or value delivery finance. There are probably 20 or so ideas that are really important and universally, universally applicable. So start with understanding those first. If you understand them, the benefit is not you know, being able to sit in a meeting and say the right buzzwords in a way that impresses the people around you. That, that doesn't matter. The value of this is when you are in a live business environment, whether you're working for somebody else or you're starting your own business or you're investing in a property or whatever, is recognizing a situation that's happening in front of you in the real world and being able to say, this reminds me of this idea that's really important right now. Or you you come across a challenge and you're stuck on something. And because of past exposure and education, you have the background to say, okay, this, what are the best questions I can ask right now? What are the things that I can, who can I talk to? What can I read? What can I try in these specific ways to get through this block that I'm experiencing? So the, the, the primary benefit of, of business education is not necessarily, you know, the, I've, I've gone to business school, I have a paper that says I should theoretically be a great manager anywhere in the world, in any industry, in any market, you know, whatever. There's, there is a certain amount of hubris in that. The value is knowing what this area of life consists of at a deep fundamental level and then whatever, whatever particular problem you're working on right now, being able to say, all right, here are the ideas or here are the questions that are going to help me get from point A to point B in the most efficient, effective way that I can muster. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, the, it, it, it's, there's really, there's a way to keep score in this game. 
Um, yeah. And you can look at any business owner and you can easily calculate that business owner's score. And it has nothing to do with where they went to business school. It has nothing to do with all the conceptual ideas they have in their head. It doesn't matter who they know or what they know. At the end of the day, you can look at their financial statements and you can say who's winning and who's losing, who's doing this correctly and who's not doing this correctly. And at the end of the day, whether they went to business school or not and who they know or what they know, really, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. I, I, I think it kind of goes beyond that too. Like one of the things that I talk about very early in the, the chapter on finance is, is the idea of sufficiency. And so in terms of like defining what is a successful business versus a not successful business, um, going back to the, the five parts of every business framework, you know, finance is, is so the business brings in sufficient profit to make it worthwhile for the owners to continue operation. So it's, there's, there's one way of looking at business of, of saying like, all right, Jeff Bezos is the best because the number is the highest. And there's also a way of looking at it saying, if you have enough for you, if you're enjoying what you're doing, if you're bringing in enough money, if the venture is sustainable, if your stress levels are manageable, if your personal relationships are healthy and strong, and everything that you're doing, you like the way it's structured and you want to keep it working that way, that's a, that's a conception of success that is very real and very valuable. And so you know, I, I really try, particularly for business owners, and you kind of see a, a lot with this, um, with, with the rise of early stage venture capital over the, the past decade and a half-ish. Um, I think, I think uh, venture accelerators like Y Combinator just got started around the time where I started the research for this. Um, with, with kind of early stage business owners, there's, there's very often a mentality of like, well, I need to make something huge. I need to, you know, go to Y Combinator, get investment, you know, raise a hundred million dollars, have a staff of 500 and IPO someday. And if I run that gauntlet all the way through to the end and I have a big payday in my bank account, that's that's what being a successful business owner is. That's the standard. And I don't think that's true. I, I think um, what a successful business looks like for each individual can be very idiosyncratic. And I think that's a that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and and thank you for correcting me on that because oftentimes, no, no oftentimes we do we 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 boil it down to numbers and and balance sheets and income statements and and that's a really good point. I mean, we had a guest on a few weeks ago who went through Y Combinator, um, has raised seventy million dollars, and we spent a lot of the episode talking about the venture capital treadmill, where basically mm -hmm. once you start taking money, your everything you're doing is geared towards growth, growth, growth because um, you're you're no longer working for yourself. You're working for your investors. And so again, uh, we talk a lot on the show about lifestyle businesses and freedom of time and starting a business that that's right for you. So I, I do, I appreciate your, your correction there because I, I, even I sometimes fall into that trap of it, it's all about the, the bottom line. And as you pointed out, it's not. Sure. So, yeah. There's, there's actually a, a concept in the personal MBA. If you go to the section on finance called the hierarchy of funding, and it talks about all of the ways that you can go about financing a business, um, all the way from you know the the bootstrappers' personal cash and personal credit, and that's where things top out, um, all the way up to venture capital. Um, it's a ladder, and and so essentially you start at the bottom with personal cash and personal credit, and as soon as there are needs, uh, business needs or personal needs that go beyond that, you start climbing the ladder. But the higher the climb. The more money you get, usually, but the more control over the business you give up in exchange. Yep. That's the fundamental trade-off. Yep. And so, yeah, for, for all of this, like particularly real estate investing, um, you're very rarely, um, in, unless you have been a successful real estate investor for a while, you're very rarely pulling out the checkbook and, say, and saying, you know, yes, here's a check for, for cash for this thing. There's some level of financing. And so I think it's really interesting and useful to understand that there's that fundamental trade-off that is to be made in certain form, forms of financing and thinking through for yourself, like what is the scope and scale of this business? What does it need to be in order to be rewarding as a business and rewarding for me? Um, and that's where I think a lot of folks um, 
play the venture game and, and are, are very good at it are, and are very successful. And there are some personal trade-offs there in, in terms of responsibility and stress um, that are, are very real and are, are worth thinking through before you go through the process instead of saying, man, I, I really wish I would have thought this through more before. So let's go back a little bit. We talked, both of us talked a little bit about financials and financial statements and understanding measurement in the business of, of how well or successful the business is going, uh, efficiency metrics, things like that. How important are those to being a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a hybrid. I think for particularly beginning entrepreneurs, uh, learning or having a familiarity with the terminology is useful. And, and as we were talking earlier, like these are, are pretty simple concepts. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of rocket science to it. And so it's, it's helpful to understand what these statements are in general, how they're calculated and why they're calculated and be able to understand when a certain statement might be beneficial. In terms of the actual, so, so if you could go to the chapter on, on finance in the personal MBA, I think um, I'm looking at it right now there's probably 25 to 30 ideas in there. You can, you can read it in, a, in an hour or so and, and have a working familiarity of, of what these are and why they're important. The actual nuts and bolts, I would say that accounting at the beginning is more important than finance because if you're not collecting the numbers, there's, there's nothing to apply financial analysis to. And that's and, and that's so something. so just to interrupt, what's the difference between accounting and finance? Because a lot of people will say, well, those are kind of the same thing, aren't they? Yeah, so they're not the same thing. So you can think of accounting as essentially the data collection portion, like making sure you are tracking the the flow of money go, coming in and the flow of money coming out in as much detail and with as much accuracy as possible. When you have that information, finance is, is the process of applying analysis to that information. So using the data that you've collected in accounting to make decisions. Is this working or no? Um, are there changes we need to make? How are we going to allocate money to the projects that we have going on right now? That sort of thing. And so for beginning entrepreneurs, what I would say is that accounting is something, particularly when you're busy creating something new, you have a lot on your plate. Um, accounting is something that is relatively easy to outsource because there are these wonderful people called CPAs who have way more experience doing this stuff than you ever will. And so let them handle the data collection and, and structuring format. And then your job as a business owner is finance to look at where is your money going? Is it going into the right places? What are our future priorities in terms of projects, trade-offs, things like that? And your job as the entrepreneur is to figure out, all right, if we have a certain amount of money to invest or we have a certain budget in different areas, what's the best way to invest these funds? That's the important part. Um, I would recommend there, there are a, a few new, you know, <laughs> wonderful in the age of technology that we have new resources to help us. Um, a few years ago, I started using a, um, an outsourced service called Bench which has been phenomenal in terms of the accounting side of the finance equation. Um, you basically get a bookkeeper who um, you forward receipts to and they sync up your bank statements. And every month you get all of the major uh, financial statements that you need, cash flow statement, income sheet, balance sheet. And um, you are having the benefit of a real live human being who knows what they're doing, taking a look at this every month. Um, so, so I would say keeping good books is the first part. If you have that, the financial analysis becomes much, much easier. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So you have a chapter in the book and I love this because this is something we didn't talk about much in business school. Uh, and that we don't talk about enough in general. Uh, the chapter is called working with yourself. Um, and it's, it's a lot about mindset um, mm -hmm. it's a lot about, in fact, you have a, a whole chapter on the human mind also in mindset, but then you have a, a chapter on working with yourself and kind of, uh, knowing yourself. And so between those two chapters, there's a lot of discussion about more less, I, I guess, less hard 
topics. Um, sure. they're, they're not equations. It, it's more, again, it's about mindset. It's about um, understanding how people work, how their minds work, both your customers um, and your own. So can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of that topic and, and maybe why isn't that covered more in business school and, and, and other places? I have no idea because it's so important. I mean, it's businesses are run by and for people. Um, and, and particularly as, as entrepreneurs or as investors, we are the instrument that we use to get everything done. If we're not operating in, in an efficient, effective way, the business doesn't have much of a chance because we are the driving force behind it. And so, and then in the broader sense, um, psychology and communication and cognitive bias, like the, the ways that our brains tend to systematically malfunction in certain predictable ways, all of those things are really important in helping you make, make good decisions, avoid making dumb mistakes or preventable mistakes, communicate with other people, uh, persuade and convince other people, be they customers or, um, or investors, uh, to see the world the way that we see it or to value the things that we value. All of those things are fundamentally cognitive psychology both on, on the applied and the behavioral sense. Like if we don't understand how humans operate, we're at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to people who do. Um, this, this was something that I, I really, really internalized in, in my, uh, my CPG career, particularly the, the, on the product development side. Like I would go to people's houses and watch them mopping their floors. And it, it sounds weird. Like, why would this big company send a highly paid individual to do something as mundane as that? And it's because watching people do what they do gives you insights about how they are approaching this particular problem that you wouldn't get any other way. Like, you have to watch them. Um, there's a famous story in, in, in the company, um, one of the defining moments of the company in, in many respects. Um, so, so Procter & Gamble makes Tide laundry detergent. And uh, there, was, there was somebody uh, several decades prior uh, who was doing the same thing that, that my job was at the time. They were in somebody's house and they were watching a, a middle-aged woman do her laundry. And at that time, laundry detergent was in you know, the big box of powder and you got a big scoop and you scooped it out and then you put it in the washing machine. This was before liquid detergent. And so the researcher who was trained as an anthropologist was watching this lady because she turned on, the, turned on the, the washing machine to let the water run. She would scoop the detergent in and then she would sit there for a little bit, like 30, 45 seconds. And she's just, she's just waiting, she's not doing anything. And then she would swish her hand around in the bottom of, of the, the laundry machine. And the researcher was like, well, let me stop you for a moment. Like, what are you doing? She's like, well, you have to swish it around or it doesn't dissolve. Now, the scientists at Procter & Gamble make really darn sure that that laundry detergent resolves. That is not a functional issue. It was a psychological issue of this, this person not necessarily trusting a process that, sh that she can't see. And so it was that insight, watching somebody actually doing the thing that they're trying to do, that led to the development of liquid laundry detergent, which is now a multi-billion dollar a year category. And so it's that kind of thing, like understanding how people are perceiving the world, understanding how they are orienting themselves to the problems that they are facing, and then using that insight to say, okay, I think there's a, there's a psychological need here. There's something that might be beneficial or worthwhile. Those become the opportunities that exist in the world that other people don't see yet because they're not paying attention to how people are thinking and how people are behaving. Wow, I, I love that. And I, I think that like right there was, if people are only listening to that one clip, um, it, it's so powerful. Um, people always talk about, well, I, I can't think of a business idea. I don't know what an opportunity is. And it really is as simple as paying attention. Yeah, there's, there's a new concept in the 10th anniversary edition. One of, it kind of falls into the category of one of the things that I wish I would have put in there from the beginning because it's essential. 
um, there's there's this idea. Um, it's it's called um, exploration and exploitation, and it's a, a problem that comes from decision making theory and computer science. There's a huge research literature on this, and uh, I've say in advance, I do not condone gambling in any way, shape or form. However, the research literature uh, usually frames the problem in terms of this. Uh, imagine you walk into a casino and there's a row of slot machines. Uh, your job is to play those slot machines and there's one of them that is going to pay out way better than all of the rest of them are. You just don't know which one. And for the sake of the experiment, let's just say that the cost of playing the machines is your time. You don't have to put money into the system. So the research literature asks the question, all right, presented with this circumstance, how do you go about figuring out which machine is best? And the, the approach or the algorithm um, is, this is, this is called, if you're interested in looking this up, it's fascinating. It's called the multi-armed bandit problem because slot machines are one-armed bandits and you have many of them. So multi-armed bandit problem. The approach that, that, uh, that researchers recommend for many very good technical reasons is a two-phase approach. So the first phase is exploration. And exploration is basically just trying a bunch of different things to see what works. And every time you try something, you collect a little bit more information about that particular option. And when you're walking into a situation where you don't have any information, information is valuable. So you should just spend most of your time trying a bunch of different things to see what works. After a period of time, you're going to have a lot more information about what you believe to be the state of the world, right? Which machines seem to be doing very well, which machines seem to be not doing very well. And you can start to shift your choices and where you are focusing your time and attention to the things that work and you ignore the things that don't. And so that's called the exploitation phase. You're just picking the best machine and you're hitting that lever over and over and over again because you think that's where the highest reward is. That seems pretty straightforward. The wrinkle, which is the, I, to me, the entire value of this way of thinking is that the exploration phase never stops. It's just a lower and lower percentage of your time because we are not omniscient beings. We, don't, we, we do not and will not ever have perfect information about the state of the world or the very best thing that we can do at any point in time. And so because that information about the world is valuable, the best approach is to, yeah, after a certain point, do the thing that's working, keep doing the thing that's working, but always focus a percentage of your time on experimental things that you do to collect information about the world around you because you never know if that's going to end up being more valuable in the long run. Um, and you won't know until you test it. I, I love that. And, and I mean, we talk a lot these days about confirmation bias and mm -hmm. we, we, we come up with a conclusion first, either based on exploration or based on whatever criteria. And then we just look for reinforcement of that idea as opposed to continuing to explore and continuing to question. And so it's just, that's, that's a great reminder of as entrepreneurs, we can't fall or we, we have to do our best not to fall prey to that confirmation bias of assuming that what we think we know about our products, our customers, our vendors, our employees, our business in general um, is not necessarily true and we should always go in with that attitude of well what if this isn't true yeah totally so i, I love that um awesome okay so switch gears a little bit um and actually no i want to go back instead of switching gears okay. um what we were just talking about exploration exploitation that actually feeds into another concept that you talk about in the book and this is a concept that we talk a lot about on the show so i, I don't want to skip over it um and that's shadow testing and uh -huh. so I don't think I've ever used the term shadow testing on the show. So I'm going to let you define it. Um, and I think it'll be a concept that's, that's, uh, that's familiar to a lot of our listeners. And maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how we should be going about doing it and why it's so important for us as business owners. Yeah. So, so shadow testing is, is the idea of testing a offer. And so and I use the, the word offer for the grand set of things that you can present to a customer. So not every not everything in the world is a product or a service. So um, it's kind of the general language. So, but, but let's say, because it's easy to visualize, we're developing a product. Um, developing products is expensive. 
and so you know both from a, a, a development and a personnel and a research and a production there's a lot that goes into that and so one of the big risks when you're developing anything is that you go through all of this time and effort and expense and you come to the point where you're offering it to a customer and the customers say yeah that doesn't really work for me and they don't buy it and so worst possible uh, situation all around um so so shadow testing is a way of trying to prevent this very bad situation from happening and as an approach it's it's quite straightforward um you come up with something to show the customer and that's usually a prototype of of some some sort maybe it's a diagram maybe it's a sketch a rendering um an explanation some text uh but something for for uh, for a potential customer to respond to. And you present them in a, to, uh, you present it to them in a sales context. Like I am trying to convince you that this is something that you're going to want to buy. You do two things. You're watching them as during this presentation, like, are they excited about this? Is this interesting? But you also ask them to buy before this thing exists. And so the, best piece of data that you can get from a prospective customer is them pulling out their wallet, checkbook, or credit card and saying, yes, please, I'll take one. If you don't get to that point, this is something that, that happens a lot, particularly with beginning entrepreneurs um, who will do something like develop an idea and then they'll tell their friends and family about it. And their friends and family Oh, I'm so excited for you. This is going to be real. This looks like a great idea. And they're being wonderful, supportive friends and family. And they're not giving you actual useful data because they're not the target market for this thing. And so shadow testing is a way of putting something in front of somebody who would be a real potential customer and getting early feedback on that. Yes, I will buy it. Yes, I will pre-order this. Please, please take my money right now so I can have one of the first ones that rolls off the line kind of data. And the better the prototype you can give you, or you can give them, and the more data you get back from customers saying, yeah, I want to buy this. This is awesome. Um, and the pre-orders roll up. You can do a bunch of different things with that. First, it substantially reduces your risk because you know that the worst thing that could happen um, this is an idea called the iron law of the market. If the market doesn't want it, you have no hope. Like the, it's just not going to work. And so if you have pre-orders, you already know you're on the, the right side of the iron law of the market. Um, if they're giving you pre-orders in terms of cash, you have, uh, so Kickstarter is a, a great example of that, right? You put up a prototype on Kickstarter, a bunch of people say, yeah, if enough other people want this, I'll give you money in advance to make this real. And then when the campaign closes, you have a whole lot of cash sitting in your, in your bank account to make the thing real. It's a, a form of shadow testing. The other thing it helps you do is go out, if this is something that uh, requires funding, you can take this proof that people are already giving you money for this and you can go to investors and say, look at all these people who have already signed up for this, this wonderful thing. This is a sure bet you can invest with confidence that there is an actual business opportunity here. And so, yeah, as, as a generalizable technique, the cool part about this is you're doing one one hundredth of the work and a very tiny fraction of the expense that it would take to build out the whole shebang, but you're getting the critical data that you're going to need to figure out if this thing is going to fly or not. Love that. And, and I love the, the mention of Kickstarter because it also brings into to clarity that idea. A lot of times, how are we going to pay for this? And you talk about, yeah. well, if you can prove the yeah. value, if you can prove the value and, and that you have customers to an investor, the investor is going to potentially invest or maybe a bank will loan you money if you if you prove you have the orders. But by the same token, if you can get people to actually spend the money in anticipation of getting the product at a later date, you can have your customers fund the development of that product. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's there, there have been, this is more and more common, the internet and the ease of charging credit cards on the internet is, is making this a lot more available and widespread that it, than it typically has. Um, in the olden days, it used to, to basically just be pre-order bonuses. And so there was some direct incentive for people, if they really were excited about this, um, to, to 
get on board in advance. Um, but yeah, I mean, platforms like Kickstarter are making things that wouldn't otherwise exist because of lack of funding or because a lack of um, a customer base exist because they're able to put essentially a page of text and a few renderings and maybe a video up in front of people. And then people are willing to vote with their dollars, whether or not that is uh, something that works for them. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So I want to talk about another concept in the book and it's in the chapter called working with yourself. And it's mm -hmm. a term I'd never heard before, but obviously it's a concept that I very much relate to. Uh, use the term acrasia. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, ac acrasia. Acrasia. Um, so it's pronounced both ways. I think acrasia is the the technical one. Okay. I, I have a feeling when you explain what this means, everybody's going to go, oh, I, yeah, I know what that is. So can you tell us what does that term mean and what can we as entrepreneurs and people, I guess, in general do to overcome it? Yeah. Okay. So so acrasia is, is one of these ideas. It actually comes from ancient Greek philosophy, hence the weird term. Um, acrasia basically is is the term for you know what you should be doing you know what is theoretically best for you and you just can't get yourself to do it like there's there's just some barrier of like ah i really should exercise every day i really should clean up my diet i really should stop drinking so much i really should you know times times a million um, and this this concept goes all the way back to the days of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, and it's it's not exactly procrastination, but it's it's a very closely related cousin to it. So procrastination is I know exactly what I need to to do, and I have the time to do it, and I have the capacity to do it man, I'd really prefer to be doing something else right now. You know, let's, let's go read Reddit for the next five hours or scroll Wikipedia in, until it's three o'clock in the morning. Um, acrasia is, is just this, this very deep, I know, I know what I need to be doing. I just can't, I can't get myself to do it. And, and the, the, the tricky part about acrasia is that it's not a straightforward problem because it comes from all sorts of different directions. So sometimes you have acrasia because you can't define what you want. Like I, I have ideas of things that might be nice, but in terms of like defining or deciding exactly what I want, look, what that looks like, no idea. Um, sometimes you, you think that what you're doing will bring you closer to something you don't want. Right. So, so it's like, if I want to work really hard in my career and get that promotion, but if I get that promotion, then I'm going to have to spend more time at work and I'm going to spend less time with my family. And then I'm going to be a bad father or mother. And like, so you see like the inner conflict start to build of like, I want to do that, but I don't want this to happen. And if I do this, then this bad, that, that's where the knot starts to tangle. Um, sometimes you just can't figure out where, how you're going to get from where you are right now to where you want to be. Like, it's, it's just kind of this, big weird mystery box of like okay i want to be a real estate investor i have no idea how to do that it still sounds great but and i know it would probably help me but i i just don't know um and then sometimes you just kind of idealize what the end result looks like to the point where once you start digging into it it's like oh man that's probably unattainable I, I want to be the richest person in the world, so I'm going to start a business. But now that I'm starting a business, I don't think I'm going to be the richest person in the world because it's a really hard thing. And you idealize the end point almost to the point where it's like by actually working on it, you're proving to yourself that that thing that you want isn't going to happen, which is very, very psychologically painful. And the best way to avoid that psychological pain is just not to. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, Acrasia is just one of those, it's the way that we tie ourselves in psychological knots uh, with all of the conflicts or things that, that we need to pay attention to or it, it, and, and places to put our attention in order to actually make progress on anything. Any strategies that we can use to kind of force ourselves past it and through it or through it? Yeah, so I, I think there's, there's one particular concept that, that I use all the time. 
So the general concept is um, self-elicitation, which is a fancy way of saying asking yourself questions. And so this applies to everything from defining what you want. Um, there's a uh, there's another technique that I talk about in the book called the fivefold why. And so um, you, it starts with a, a very very straightforward goal setting exercise of like you just write down a whole bunch of things that you want. And then uh, similar to from the business side, root cause analysis, where you're looking at something that happened, you're like, well, why did that happen? And then why did that happen? And then why did that happen? And you try to get back to the thing. It's like, no, this is the thing that happened that set off this chain of events. You can do the same thing with your goals. So I want this. Well, why do I want this? Let's take a step back and then take a step back and take a step back until you get to the closest thing to a root desire you can identify. And if you can do that, you can start working on the root cause goals instead of the things that you superficially want without thinking it through. So a, a good classic example in this, this territory is a lot of people want to have a million dollars or $10 million or $100 million. And when you track the root cause of that back, very often it is an emotional experience. Like I want to feel free and in control of my life. I want to have a lack of stress. Like it's, it's all of these psychological, emotional benefits. It's not necessarily the, the utility of having $10 million in your bank account. So if that's the case, understanding that there are these core emotional, psychological desires, that's what the real prize is. You can start looking for other ways to get that. Um, maybe it's starting your own business. Maybe it's paying off your mortgage. Maybe it's, you know, there, there are 500 ways that you can get to feeling more free and in control of my life that don't have anything to do with money. And so tracking the root cause of, of these things that we decide that we want for ourselves gives us a lot more latitude in terms of how we go about trying to get what we what we think we want. I, I love that. And yeah, so often uh, we start with the, I want to make a lot of money. And, but we ask ourselves, well, why is that? And you keep drilling down and you realize that at the end of the day, that's not at all what you want. Um, you just haven't asked yourself the right question. So I love that idea of self-solicitation. I'm going to start using that term. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask two very general questions here towards the end. Um, First, for the listeners out there that are looking to get started, that are they're ready to make the leap, but they just haven't like gotten over that hump, what are some suggestions you have that we haven't already talked about today? Um, some of your just best suggestions for our listeners who are, are really like looking to get into business, but just haven't made that leap yet. Give, give, give us some motivation. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, we'll, we'll do a couple things um, aside from the obvious, like reading or listening through the personal MBA is going to give you a lot of, of how to think about this particular area of life. I think the two things that I can recommend up front, um, your early job, and this kind of ties into to what we were talking about in terms of product develop, development. Um, think of yourself less of an entrepreneur at first and more of an anthropologist. Your job is to go through the world with your eyes wide open paying very, very close attention to what people do, what they talk about, what they're frustrated with, and what they complain about. And so that particular orientation to the world is you're just, you're looking for problems. You're looking for hassles. You're looking for things that could be better and should be better, but for whatever odd reason, they aren't better yet. Um, so, you know, personal example of, of this for me, um, when I started this whole project, I was looking for a book, book like the personal MBA. And I figured like business has been studied uh, in a formal way for many, many decades now. Some business professor somewhere had to have just written the introductory, like this is what businesses are and how they work. And it took me a, a long time of searching for it to realized that it didn't exist. And so it's like, okay, there's an opportunity here. There's a need here. Throw it out in the market, test it. Yeah, this is something that works. This is something that benefits people. So your first job is to 
notice. Your second job, once you've noticed a problem that sh appears that it should have a solution, but you can't find one yet, is to start experimenting and to start testing. And that's where ideas like shadow testing, like a minimum viable offer or minimum viable product. What is the smallest, cheapest, quickest way that you can start trying to test providing value around this thing to other people? Um, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be expensive. Doesn't ha you don't have to quit your day job. You, know, you don't have to do any of these things. It's just starting to test ideas around this specific need that you've identified. And the more you're able to do that, the faster you'll find something that appears to A, actually help people, and B, do it in a way that is valuable enough for other people to pay for. And if you have those two things, you have the start of a viable business. Love it. Love it. Okay. I'm going to flip the question. I'm going to say for those of us that are getting started, what's the biggest mistake you see new entrepreneurs, new business owners make? And what, what should we be doing to avoid those mistakes? Okay. Biggest mistake. Um, there's, there's a cluster and there's, there's an idea in, in, um, the psychology, uh, section of the book. I think it's, I think it's working with, with ourselves um, that I call status malfunction. And uh, this is the general idea that all things being equal, uh, people will tend to choose options that they believe enhance their status in some way. Um, the best way to visualize this is, is just pay attention to what people will post on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Like those are the things, like the way that we represent ourselves in the world. Um, or think of like, here's, here's a classic example from on the, the consumer psychology standpoint. A Rolex does not tell time any better than a cheap Timex or Casio watch. That's not the point. The point is the Rolex is a status signal that, that tells something of how you want to portray yourself to the rest of the world to other people who notice the Rolex. Um, one of the really big traps that I see early entrepreneurs fall into um, is making early business decisions or priority or setting certain priorities all around signaling status as an entrepreneur instead of doing the things that an entrepreneur does. You don't need fancy business cards. You don't need a fancy office. You don't need to raise a hundred million dollars of venture capital. Uh, you don't need all of all of the accoutrements or signaling of entrepreneurship, you need to do what an entrepreneur does, which is make something valuable and market and sell it and deliver it. Um, so so as, as much as possible, focusing your effort and attention around the five parts of every business and specifically not focusing your time and attention and money on all of the things that are not that. That's great. That is fantastic advice. Okay. Normally we'd be asking the four more at this point, the same four questions that we ask all of our guests, but because Carol's not here, I'm going to forego the four more today. Um, but I do want to ask one of the four more questions because uh, I, this, this is the question I like. Um, I assume that because you are an avid writer of business books, you're probably also an avid reader of business books. Uh, besides the personal MBA, Master the Art of Business. Um, are there any other great books out there that you would recommend that that uh, our listeners should be reading? There are so many great business books. It's, it's great. I actually have, if you go to personalmba.com, um, one of the early incarnations of the Personal MBA as a project um, was essentially a list of the business books that I found most useful in doing this research. So if you go to, uh, if you go to personalmba.com, click on the recommended reading list link, I have a list of 99 excellent books about all of the topics that we've discussed. And so you can think of, of the personal MBA as kind of the, the 50, 100,000 foot view of business. And if there's something particularly interesting or valuable or um, relevant to your particular uh, problems, um, you can just go to the recommended reading list and pick up any of, any of those books. And, and you will find something uh, illuminating and, and useful and productive there. That's awesome. 
Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So the book is The Personal MBA, Master the Art of Business, the 10th Anniversary Edition, and it is out today, September 1st, 2020. Josh, this has been awesome. I want to give you an opportunity here at the very end uh, to tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, where they can purchase the book, and anything else you want to talk about before we go. Jay, this has been such an awesome conversation. Thanks thanks for having me on. It's really fun. Uh, I, I think if if you find this information uh, useful and valuable, two best ways to, to find me. Um, already mentioned, personalmba.com is the website for the book. Um, you can find um, the reading list that I just mentioned, um, an essay that kicked off the whole Personal MBA project, as well as an index of all of the terms that are in the book. Um, you can find that all at, at personalmba.com. Um, if you're interested in my, my further research and writing, so uh, business is one of my primary topics, but it's not my only talk topic. Um, I write a lot about uh, skill acquisition and learning, um, as, as well as um, some of the psychological, philosophical parts of dealing with things like large ambitious projects and uncertainty and change. Um, so if you're interested in, in exploring some of my other writing, uh, the best place to go is joshkaufman.net. And that's that you can find all of my, my other books and essays and research, research there. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that that is in the show notes for anybody that wants those links. Josh, this is fantastic. We really appreciate you being here. Congratulations on the, uh, on the third edition of the book and, Thanks. uh, would love to have you back and hear about your, your new projects in a year or two. I'm happy to hang out anytime. This, awesome. this has been great fun. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Josh. Okay. I'm not going to lie. That wasn't nearly as much fun as it would have been with Carol Scott across the screen from me, but that was still an awesome, awesome episode. So many things we discussed here that, that, uh, that were just absolute gold. Um, exploration and exploitation, exploitation, basically this idea of constantly testing, constantly, um, checking to see how we can do things better, how we can iterate and improve our business and our systems and our processes, uh, every single day. The idea of shadow testing and uh, the ability to, to test an idea quickly and inexpensively uh, so that you're not wasting a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money before launching a business. Uh, the whole discussion of acrasia. So I know I have this problem of so many things I know I should be doing in my personal, my business life, but for some reason I find myself doing just the opposite. So I love Josh's uh, takeaway of self um, self solicitation and just asking ourselves, why are we doing things and why are we not doing things and just getting to know ourselves so that we can constantly be improving. Just so many great takeaways. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the 10th anniversary edition of the personal MBA for any additional information about Josh and the stuff we talked about. Don't forget, check out our show notes and I guess that's all I have. So I'm Jay and I'm Jay and I guess I'll be seeing you next week. Wow, that was a really, really bad ending, but it's just not as good without Carol Scott. So everybody have an amazing week. Stay happy, stay healthy, and we will see you next week on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.